Hello everyone. Lately I've seen a fair bit of discussion about the notion of a universal basic income. Now the idea there is that you would pay every citizen, probably including children, a certain de defined amount every month, say, regardless of their circumstances or income or any other factors. The, f the only factor would be that they are, say, citizens of the country. Or, um, you know, landed immigrants or what have you. This would replace all other social assistance programs, uh, except health care, likely. So this would replace, uh, say, the Canada Pension Plan, unemployment insurance, um, it would uh, replace minimum wages. There would no, be no more minimum wages under this type of scheme. There would be no complicated uh, rules for collecting uh, the, this um, universal basic income, and it would be given to everybody unconditionally. That's the purpose, that's the point of it being universal. So that could be, say, whatever is de determined uh, by some mechanism to be the minimum amount that we feel people should have. This universal basic income would not be subject to income tax. It would just be money that came in. With this, you, would el you could eliminate tax brackets. Um, you would you would certainly be able to eliminate the bottom zero percent bracket where you don't pay income tax because your income's below a certain amount. Uh, that would you know you, you could potentially simplify the income tax system as well. Uh, people wouldn't have to be putting money aside for or as much money aside for retirement because the universal basic income would be there. Now, uh, the question, the, the really good question is how do you pay for it? Well, you have a little bit of a problem there in that you're paying this to everybody and that means necessarily you're going to have population times amount that you have to pay up, you know, that there, there's, it's simple math, right? You, you can't avoid that. So where do you get the money? Well, say we work out that the minimum amount, just for nice round numbers, is say $10,000 per year, okay? so. Uh, whatever that works out to monthly, but say it's $10,000 per year. And remember, there's no income tax on this. So that's $10,000 take home cash, okay? So say it's $10,000. Say you have 30 million eligible people to get that $10,000 every year. Well, that's $300 billion that you have to pay out every year. Now, the first thing you do is you look up what are these programs that I can cancel now, what are they costing every year? And you subtract that from the 300 billion. I don't know what's left over, uh, it depends on the cost of those programs, but certainly the cost of, say, a pension, the Canada Pension Plan, and employment insurance uh, would uh, uh, would come off of that. Now, that wouldn't reduce the total by as much as you might think, because uh, the cost right now is offset at least somewhat by premiums paid by uh, employers and employees. Of course, if you get rid of the programs altogether, the CPP and EI, 
you reduce the, uh, the overhead of administering it, and you also give an immediate shot in the arm to the economy because employers no longer have to pay that as a cost of doing business, of having employees, and employees no longer have to pay it as part of having a job. So you wouldn't uh, necessarily have to uh, uh, you know you wouldn't necessarily get the savings that you would expect but you certainly get an economic boost and that could potentially improve uh, revenue from sales taxes and stuff but that said you're still left with a fairly large chunk of money that you have to come up with from somewhere now, if you take a look at the uh, massive government deficits and so on, you know that this isn't going to be a particularly massive amount compared to the total budget. Uh, but it's not going to be nothing either. So how do you pay for it? Well, you can't just raise the taxes on the rich. That's not going to be uh, fair. Um, you can't, uh, and you can't just borrow it because uh, that leaves you the debt servicing costs, and then that causes the government expenditures to necessarily rise exponentially over time, which is already happening. So we need some way of getting this money and giving it to the people. There is a solution to this that will probably work. And that is monetary reform. Now by this, uh, I invite anybody who's interested in this notion to check out Positive Money at uh, positivemoney.org, I believe. Uh, they have some really good uh, material on uh, monetary reform that uh, while it's uh, UK-centric, the basic uh, ideas behind it are applicable everywhere. The, the basics of it, the, the base, core basics of it, are you eliminate fractional or no reserve lending, period. And you make, make it so that the uh, banks have to maintain a 100% reserve against any demand de uh, deposit. They have to have the cash on hand to back up any demand deposit. Now, a demand deposit is money you put in your bank account uh, that you're entitled to immediately on request, but it's also lines of credit, uh, you know, credit cards, that sort of thing. That's a demand deposit, even though the money, you're actually borrowing money. Basically, you're saying they can't lend money they don't actually have that doesn't actually belong to them. That hasn't actually been given to them for that purpose. So you would have two different types of bank account. You'd have your basic demand account and you'd have your investment account. The money in the demand account would be guaranteed it, uh, there would have to be, for every dollar you have on deposit in there, there has to be a dollar available. And for uh, an investment type account, the principal would not be guaranteed. You would be taking the risk of the investment. Now that risk might be relatively small, aggregated across all of the investments the bank is making on your behalf, uh, but if they happen to get unlucky, you would lose your principal or some portion of it. You'd be taking the risk uh, in order to get the reward. But, so you wouldn't be getting interest on your demand deposits. And you, your principal in your uh, investment account might not be available on demand. It, they, if the bank doesn't have it available, they can't give it to you. And you wouldn't necessarily be able to force them to. Now this would prevent banks from, from being too big to fail because if they did fail, the assets would have to be there to back up the accounts, the demand accounts, and the investment accounts would be lost. And it would be fair. 
and then a poorly run bank would could go bankrupt. And now you could build some safeguards in there uh, to prevent people from losing uh, more than they have to uh, in the case of insolvency or malfeasance on the part of the bank operator. But the idea here is that you prevent the banks from lending money they don't have. Uh, when you get a loan from the bank, uh, and that is everything from a credit card to, uh, to an actual term loan, uh, they're not actually lending you money. They're manufacturing it out of thin air. It's an accounting trick where you add an asset on, on one side of the ledger and a liability on the other side. It balances out to zero, therefore, uh, therefore you don't, you, you know, you're not getting a net change in assets or, or in, you know, in uh, uh, value uh, for the bank's assets. Uh, so basically it's an accounting trick. They're creating money out of nothing with nothing backing it. Now, obviously a fiat currency is doing something similar, but that's being backed at least by the government and the fact that you have to use that to pay the government your taxes or what have you. So, uh, so you end if you remove this ability of a bank to give you a loan without having the money, uh, the, the assets available to loan, then you can eliminate the money multiplying effect of, of that and it now becomes safe for a central bank to, or the government or whatever agency you set up to print money, uh, either electronically or physically, to increase the money supply to directly control inflation because they would have direct control over the total money in circulation. Um, but that does raise a problem and how do you get newly printed money into circulation, uh, into the real economy? Because you don't want to be adding it to the investment economy, the financial markets, because that doesn't do real work and that doesn't actually get into the economy that needs the money circulating to transact business. Now, you might not be aware of it, but as economic activity increases, as an economy grows, the amount of money needed in circulation to maintain liquidity and keep the economy running increases. If it doesn't increase, you end up with deflation and potential stagnation because while there might be the resources available, people, uh, uh, actual natural resources, whatever, to conduct the business of the economy, there's no way to uh, transact business if you don't have the actual money available to do it. And it, it's not necessarily lack of loans that cause this. It's lack of money altogether. It causes deflation. It causes... Uh, hoarding and that tends to make a downward spiral. So you want to avoid deflation. Now the easy way, there's two ways to end deflation. Shrink the economy or increase the money supply. If you increase shrinking the economy decreases the demand for money. Increasing the money supply increases supply. So it's the supply and demand equation. So if you can if your economy needs more money, and this is one of the reasons austerity doesn't work, is because it reduces the money supply and therefore hamstrings the economy. Uh, and this is why governments have been borrowing to beat the band for the past uh, couple, three decades, uh, instead, you know, when they should, in fact, have been printing money. Uh, and this is why government debt has ballooned and why it can't be paid off under the current system. And it's also why the bankers are getting rich and nobody else is. Now, uh, you have a problem if the central bank, say, is going to print more money. 
uh, how does it get into the real economy that needs it to transact business? Well, the current method of, of the central banks are using is called quantitative easing, and basically it's just putting money into the financial markets. That doesn't work. All it does is increase, you know, cause inflation in the financial markets. It doesn't help the real economy. So the other possibility is you give it to the government to spend on, on things. Well, that would work. Uh, they could spend it on infrastructure. That'll go into the real economy. Uh, they could spend it on health care. That actually goes into the real economy. Uh, they could spend it on social programs. Uh, that would goes more directly into the real economy. And this is where a universal basic income comes in. You can use the universal basic income as one of the vehicles that gets newly created money into the hands of the people that will spend it into the real economy. And that's the real people. That, I think, is the way to pay for a universal basic income. There is the question of what do you do if you end up in an inflationary environment? You've got too much money out there. Well, in that case, you would either increase taxes somewhere or you'd uh, reduce government spending somewhere uh, and uh, you would print less money. Uh, you would certainly print less money in that case and then govern the government, if it wants to maintain its level of spending, would have to uh, borrow money from somewhere or they have to cut spending. But if you make the universal basic income something they can't cut, then you can uh, make sure that there's always money going into the real economy, no matter how much what taxes are taking out of it. And I think if we did this, we could have a sustainable system with a deep, with a functional safety net, social safety net, without having ballooning, exponentially growing government debt. Uh, and on top of that, if we change the monetary system so we could do this, we would actually be slowly reducing the government uh, expenditures because we would be slowly paying off the existing bonds, the existing loans. So that would also go some way toward uh, paying for the universal basic income. So it would reduce, over time, the amount of money that had to be printed to cover the universal basic income because the government expenditures, necessary expenditures to cover expenses, would go down as the interest costs go down. So there you have it, universal basic income. I think it's actually a good idea if done right. If done wrong, it will fail miserably. Unfortunately, the way I see things going right now, the actual situation, uh, the way it would get implemented, would be wrong. We have to have monetary reform, I believe, I strongly believe, we have to have the monetary reform before we attempt to do a universal basic income situation. And even the monetary reform itself would be a substantial improvement over the current situation. So, both together, I think they'd probably work very, very well if managed sensibly. And I don't think it's that difficult to manage sensibly. On the other hand, monetary reform on its own, I think would uh, have a great benefit, but universal basic income on its own, I think would fail miserably. So here's for monetary reform followed by a universal basic income. Anyway, that's my thoughts on that subject. If you want to be notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.